well, could be afternoon. Um, so we just finished yesterday with the sacrificial lamb. It's the sacrifice lamb. And Ellie's staying. She's probably in danger at the hotel, but right now she's with David. I think they're going to dinner. Could be wrong. Dark-skinned Arab bellhops scurry to and from about the walnut-paneled lobby. Aristocratic-looking gentlemen reading the London Times sat slouched in deep red leather chairs while waiters served them whiskey or gin and tonic with twists of Palestine-grown limes. The carpet, a rich red floral, swirled around the well-polished shoes of the British officers and government staff who spent their spare hours relaxing and reliving the latest events. All in all, the establishment <coughs> excuse me, bore remarkable similarity to the savory hotel in London. Brass lamps on the tables near the chairs gave the feeling of an English manor, and the bar adjacent to the lobby, Ellie Glamps, glimpsed paintings of horses soaring over jumps and galloping across the broad meadows of England. Why, Ellie wondered, why are they so in love with the atmosphere of Great Britain, and yet they are eager to stay here? Dressed in a tuxedo, the head waiters stood at attention near a small desk as they walked into the high ceiling dining room with white tablecloths, gleaming silver, gracing the delicate Queen Anne tables. The waiters gracefully moved from one table to another, bowing slightly, seeing to the needs of the diner before the needs were even realized. Ellie had a strong sensation that she had walked into a whole porter comedy where everyone was droll and witty and the world was simple. She tried to forget the military guard stationed outside throughout the grounds, for tonight she decided she would pretend that this charade was the real world, and the world outside did not exist. Sir, a waiter said with a heavy British accent, uh, we have a reservation for two. Meyer, I stopped by this afternoon. Your phones are all messed up. The head waiter smiled slightly uneasy, Ellie thought, at the reminder that the real world touched even King David. Quite, he said. Meyer, ah, oh, yes, this way. He took two leather-bound menus from a rack and led them away to a corner table for two, almost hidden behind a potted palm. He pulled Ellie's chair out for her, then lit a tall white candle, and with a bow was gone. David searched the menu without seeing, angrily skimming the pages, and Ellie looked over the top of hers and watched him, a tolerant smile on her lips. Would you rather take me someplace else? She asked. Yeah, how about the copper kettle on the corner of Gro Grover and Sunset? My mind is made up. Your parents are going to be worried, he glared at her. I'm a big girl, and I can take care of myself. Like you did in the riot? They'd have been shipping you home in a box if I hadn't. I know that. Ellie laid down her menu. But something has happened to me. Like, well, I... You could say that something has happened to you, David pretended to read the menu again. I mean, inside. Something's going on with me, she tried to say calmly. You're on overload. That's what. There might be some way that I can help here. As she picked up the menu, she felt a surge of irritation. Who do you think you are? Joan of Arc? St. Ellie? You're going to get yourself killed for the noble cause of journalism. Even people who fought their way across Europe are going to get blasted up in this thing. Walking down the street can be fatal if we, you and I, have any future at all together. You're assuming an awful lot, David. Ellie interrupted, just like you always did. I told you I'm not the same. How do you think Moshi feels about you if you ask to stay? His voice got a little louder. I think he loves me. Not as much as he loves his stinking little piece of real estate, doesn't he? 
I'm a journalist. It's my job. Two days ago, you were an archaeologist flunky on your way back home, and now all of a sudden you're a journalist? Well, I noticed a couple casting sideways glances at David and his, as his voice got progressively louder. Lower your voice, Ellie said too loudly. I've had it with you, David. If that is all you think of me, I don't care if it means you're going to win a Pulitzer. Do you hear me? Yes, I do, and so does everyone else in the room. I want to be a journalist. You want to be a journalist. Go ahead, but do it without me. I want a woman, okay? That's it. We're finished. The shadow of the waiter fell over the table. Angrily, Ellie and David glared up at him. Is there anything I can get for you? He said, feeling uncomfortable under their gaze. Yes, Ellie stood up. A taxi. Okay. Now, Moshi stared blankly out the window to where the sun shone on the glistening surface of the dome of the Mosque of Omar. Only once had he stood on the soil of the sacred spot where Abraham had offered his son to the altar he built with his own two hands. A tall, lanky boy of 15, Moshi had donned a stolen uniform of a British soldier and had walked right past the Muslim guards in the gates of the mosque. No Jew could openly visit the site without fear of reprisal or arrest. Sweat formed on his brow, and his heart had beat faster as he strode into the courtyard. He imagined how Abraham felt, knowing he had come to this place to offer his son as a sacrifice. His mouth tasted of iron, and the pit of his stomach churned, and yet God had been faithful, Moshe remembered. God had provided a ram for the sacrifice so Isaac had not died. Moshi raised his eyes toward the western wall which stood as the last remaining edifice of the great temple, which had been destroyed along with the nation of Israel nearly 2,000 years before. Moshi had not entered the mosque but instead had visualized the ragged band of Jews who prayed just on the other side of the wall. They, too, prayed for a Savior who would one day deliver Jerusalem. Only a thin wall of hand-hewn stones separated those Jews from the Muslims he walked with in the courtyard. But it was a line that marked the hardness of men's hearts, he had thought. Moshe turned from the window and sat down heavily at his desk. He toyed with the photograph of the scroll, the book of Is Isaiah was written when the great temple stood where the Ma Muslim shrine is now. Not one word had been changed. The promises still remained. The destruction of Israel and the wanderings of her people had all been foretold. Now her people were returning. But what of the Messiah? He had long since turned his back on the belief of the Holy One of Israel, and yet the Orthodox Jews who prayed at the wall still denied that there could be a nation again unless Messiah came personally to govern and redeem them. There were so many different beliefs among the Jews in the world. Surely there must be one truth in this all. Hmm. I lost my spot, Mom. <laughs> Had the Messiah come to Israel already once, as Howard believed? Had God provided the Holy One as a lamb of sacrifice to be redeemed and restore in a different way than the way they had always expected? The small brass lamp at Moshe's cluttered desk illuminated the glossy photographs of the Isaiah scroll. Moshe reread the confirmation from John Hopkins University. Congratulations, you may well have uncovered the most significant find in recent history. The material confirms the scroll to be of first century origin. For what seemed like the hundredth time, Moshi leafed through the photographs, amazed at the clear, precise lettering of the ancient writings. He opened the most recent edition of the Hebrew text of Isaiah, scanned the pages for any variation of the wording between the scroll and the modern-day printed page. 
Letter by letter, the words read the same. The message was the same. Moshi flipped to Isaiah 53 and frowned as he carefully reread the words. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each one has turned his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. Moshe's eyes fell on the modern rabbinical commentaries below the text. The prophet refers to the nation Israel. Although the text has remained unchanged for over 2,000 years, the interpretation of scripture had indeed changed. He leaned back and scratched his head, trying to remember the ancient commentaries he came across on this passage so many years before. He stood and searched the bookshelves for the Aramaic translation written in the second century of Rabbi Jonathan ben Uzel, a disciple of the great Hayel. Targum Jonathan on Isaiah 53, he muttered, pulling the dusk, dusty volume from the shelf. He opened the book to the 52nd chapter and began to read the Aramaic. Behold, my servant Messiah shall prosper. He frowned at the word Messiah. Then he laid the book down and with a feeling of urgent, urgency searched for the 9th century prayer book on the topmost shelf. He carefully removed the crumbling book and leafed through its pages until he found the paragraph of the 53rd chapter of Isaiah written for recitation on Yom Kippur. Messiah, our iniquities and the yoke of our transgressions he did bear, for he was wounded for transgression. He carries our sin upon his shoulders that we may find forgiveness for our iniquities. And so, he said aloud, the interpretation was changed, although the words remained the same. The ancients knew the prophet spoke of the Messiah. How inconvenient truth can be at times. He half smiled, staring down at the photograph washed in the light, especially when for so long the one you thought to be your enemy is in fact your savior. This is truth. Moshe Sacker, he said aloud to himself. So what will you do with the Messiah, the one called Christ? Okay, so it looks like um, God's working on Moshe's heart. Uh, that's the end of chapter 18. Chapter 19 is the Haganah woman. And so we will be um, starting there next time we read Mom. This uh, had Isaiah 53 in it, and we know that song, yeah. So um, it was, yeah, I like that when they quote, quote scripture, which is not always. But yeah, you know, Mom, you know that song. All we like sheep have gone astray, turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Praise God for his mercies and his grace for us. Okay, uh, so we're going to read a whole new chapter next week. No, next time. But I hope you have a great rest of the day. Okay, Mom, I love you. Mwah. You know, I read somewhere that that is an archaic, archaic uh, move when you mwah, blow a kiss. Archaic. And I thought, are you kidding me? I do that all the time. Okay, Mom. <laughs>